This is an oddly specific series of videos about ECMO cannulation and managing ECMO flows in single ventricle heart disease. So if you don't know what that means, this video may not be for you. But you're welcome to stick around and learn. In this series of videos, I'm going to talk about cannula position in palliated single ventricle heart disease and how these patients should be managed based on where the cannula are. I'm going to use hypoplastic left heart syndrome as my example, though you can extrapolate this to any single ventricle lesion. But first, let's do a quick review of ECMO in a two-ventricle heart. There are three common options for cannula placement in ECMO. Number one, the SVC for the venous cannula and the carotid artery for the arterial. Number two, femoral vein and artery. And number three, central cannulation, where the right atrium and the ascending aorta are cannulated directly through a sternal incision. For two-ventricle hearts, where the patient is cannulated, it doesn't matter much for ECMO flows because all these drain the blue blood from the right atrium, put it through the circuit, and pump the red blood back into the aorta. In fact, the cannula position doesn't make a big difference for interstage hearts either, but it will be a big deal after stage two palliation, which is why we are talking about it now. In the case of our two ventricle patient, flows of around 100 to 120 mils per kilo per minute will get you a reasonable cardiac output and be adequate to support the patient. Now let's talk about our interstage hypoplastic left heart patient, which can come in two variations, Norwood with an RV to P shunt, also known as a Sano shunt, or Norwood with a systemic artery to pulmonary artery shunt, usually a BTT shunt. If your patient has had a hybrid procedure, that's going to be similar to the BTT shunt on ECMO. Managing these two heart anatomies on ECMO is different, so you have to know which one your patient has. Let's start with a Sano shunt. In this heart, there's no direct connection between the systemic and pulmonary circulation. Blue blood is drained from the atrium and red blood injected into the aorta where it flows to the body. Not too different from a two ventricle heart, so flows of 100 to 120 should be good. ECMO management is potentially different if the patient has an AP shunt. Now, when oxygenated blood is injected into the aorta, it has a choice on where to go, either to the body or to the lungs. And there can be a lot of blood that goes to the lungs. So if you are running your flows at a typical 100 to 120, you may not deliver enough flow to the body, resulting in hypotension and acidosis. Sometimes, flows of 200 mils per kilo per minute are required to get enough blood to the systemic circulation. That is, if the shunt is open. If the ECMO cannulation was done through an open chest, the surgeon has the opportunity to clip the shunt closed. And you need to get that information when getting handoff. Also, obstructed shunts may be one of the reasons for a patient to end up on ECMO, and shunts can clot during low-flow shock states in CPR. So figuring out if the shunt is open is important early on to help guide the circuit management. If the shunt is open, we want to decrease the flow to the lungs as much as possible. To do this, we can try to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. So, deliver 21% FiO2 to the lungs, maintain a higher CO2, and use higher ventilator pressures and then decrease systemic vascular resistance to make it easier for blood to flow to the body. If the shunt is closed, normal flows and ventilator management should be adequate. In the next video, I'll cover ECMO cannulation and Glenn circulation.